Buyer's remorse? You betcha. Stick around, and we'll get right to it. So I was on the phone the other night with a buddy of mine, and we were talking back and forth, reminiscing kind of about uh, some purchases we had made in the past for Ham Radio that ultimately we regretted. And it got me to thinking that it would be kind of an interesting video to put together. Part of this, uh, part of the things on this list are, well, they're just not great products. Other things on this list I bought because I didn't know any better. Let's take a look at my top five. Coming in at number one is the MFJ 1910 mast. Now, don't think that I'm bashing on all MFJ products. That is by no means the case. In fact, I still have and use several of their products on a daily basis. However, I would avoid the 1910 if I was just getting into ham radio again and looking for a mast. The first time I took mine out, I broke either the first section or the first two sections of that mast. I don't remember which because it's been quite a while ago. For just 20 bucks more, at least as of the time of this recording, I would be picking up the mast by my friends at TN07 Engineering. For just 20 bucks more, you will have a much more substantial mast. I've been using one of their masts for five, six, maybe seven years now, and have not yet broken it. So, if you want a good, reliable mast that you can depend on for years to come, definitely take a look at the one by TN07. Number two on the list is the first Go Box that I ever built. I really had no clue what I was doing. I just saw something that someone else had done and decided that I want to do that as well. Once I got that box finished, that thing weighed 35, maybe 40 pounds. It had everything, including the kitchen sink in it. Well, not literally, but almost. It did have a lot of capability. The downside to it was it weighed so stinking much that I hesitated to even take the thing out into the field. It was just a bear to lug around and load into the vehicle. So I finally stripped that box completely clean, sold the box itself off, and then started working on a more practical go box. So I guess my advice here is to really think through what you actually need before you start building that go box. Are you really going to require two or three radios in one box. My approach nowadays is to do away with the boxes and the bags all together and go with a modular approach. I've done a video on that in the past and I'll leave a link to it either down in the description below or somewhere up here around the top. Number three is several cheap radios. And I'm not going to call out any one particular manufacturers per se. But I should have saved my money and bought a decent radio right up front instead of trying to have multiple cheap radios. True story for you guys. The first radio I ever tried to run in the mobile was a Baofeng UV5R handheld. And let's just say that went over like a lead balloon. Now, you don't have to go out and buy the most expensive radio when you're just getting started. There's a lot of other things that you want or need to put your money towards. So I'm not advocating that you go out and buy top of the line, but don't try to do like I did and use a Baofeng as a mobile radio. I think you'll only run into disappointment. Number four on the list is antennas, and there was a lot of them that I tried over uh, the first year or two. You see, basically, I just didn't understand. I didn't understand antennas. I didn't understand propagation. I didn't understand takeoff angles of antennas, and I didn't understand that I could really just build my own. And I bought several antennas over that first year, maybe two years, that I ultimately regretted buying. So many of those could have just been built by me in the shack with very expensive parts had I've had an antenna analyzer. And that's one of the things that I wish I'd have bought sooner. 
Maybe we'll do another video on that in the future, talking about tools that I wish I'd have bought sooner that would have made this journey so much easier. But back to the antennas, you really need to do a little bit of research and understand what your needs are and what the capability of an antenna is. If you're looking for DX contacts, you probably don't want to run an NVIS antenna. Now, is that saying you can't make a DX contact with an NVIS antenna? No, it's just saying that it's not the best suited tool for the job. However, if you want to run an NVIS setup, you probably don't want to use a vertical antenna. So just figure out what your needs are, what you really want to do, and then Honestly, instead of buying an antenna, I would take a look at picking up an antenna analyzer and building your own. You're going to learn quite a bit about antennas once you start building your own. Now, coming in at number five, and I do have a bonus for you guys today, but coming in at number five is SLA batteries. You got to remember, I've had my ticket for a decade now, and when I first got into this hobby, SLA batteries were pretty much normal to see used in everyone's kits. Lithium iron phosphate was on the market, but it was prohibitively expensive and something that I avoided for several years. Now, do I wish I'd have jumped into those right out of the gate? Well, maybe not because they were probably five, six times as expensive as an SLA. The SLAs did allow me to limp by for a few years, but it was a game changer when I moved to lithium iron phosphate. Now, I doubt any of you are going to consider buying SLA batteries, but if you have any that are left in some of your older kits, it's definitely worth the upgrade. Lithium iron phosphate has come down in price significantly over the last 10 years, and it's well worth the money spent. All right, so here's one that's going to probably be a bit controversial. Earlier, I told you when we were talking about antennas that you need an analyzer, and that is a true statement. However, I honestly regret buying the Nano VNA. Now, I'm not going to argue that it is a perfectly acceptable antenna analyzer. The one I purchased, I used for probably a year or more and got great results out of it. The primary thing with me or for me was I couldn't read the display in direct sunlight and that presented a big problem. I was constantly having to hunt shade or shade, you know, provide some sort of shade for the display while I was trying to read it and it was just a pain in the rear end. I ended up going with a Rig Experts Stick Pro, which is very easy to read, even in direct sunlight. Now, you're going to pay quite a bit more for that uh, Stick Pro, but just being able to read it in direct sunlight was worth the money to me. If you've got to cut corners though somewhere, that Nano VNA is perfectly acceptable to get started with. Just understand that in direct sunlight, you're probably going to have some issues reading that display. So there's a look at six items I regret buying since I became a ham radio operator. What do you regret buying? Leave it down in the comments below. If you found today's information helpful, be sure to give us a thumbs up before you head off. We will see you guys on the next one. Until then, 7-3.